So we are starting our seminar. We have organized it around three themes. There could have been so many other themes, but we hope these three major themes will bring out our thoughts. Um, and I would like to start by introducing our panelists. Um, I would like to start by introducing um, Mr. Luis Males Morales uh, from Ecuador. Mr. Males has a BA in economics, a BA in corporate finance from the University of San Francisco of Quito, and an associate degree in computer science from Hawking College in the US. He has advanced studies in local development and territory in Flaxo in Ecuador and development assistance at the University of Leida in Spain. Between his professional experience, he stands out under Secretary of Intercultural Bilingual Education of the Ministry of Education, Advisor of inter on Intercultural Issues, General Coordinator of North Region of Education, Monitoring Advisor uh, uh, on intercultural uh, monitoring and evaluation advisor of the ministry coordinator of knowledge and human talent, director of monitoring and evaluation of territorial development in the national secretariat of planning and development, and director of local economic development in the municipality of Otavalo. Among his most relevant works in the public sector, we can mention his active participation in the reform of the Ecuadorian state through the National Development Plan 2009 to 2013, contribution to the equity model for the decentralization of competencies, monitoring of the national information system science, technology, innovation, and traditional knowledge of Ecuador and strengthening of the intercultural bilingual education system. With regard to social organizations and indigenous peoples, he has actively worked in several social enterprises with an identity, which resulted in the founding of the Unio Tavalo Credit Unit, which nowadays serves more than 5,000 people. He currently works as executive director of the Institute of Ancestral Languages, Sciences, and Knowledge of Ecuador, governmental organization whose institutional mission promotes the use and development of the traditional languages and knowledge of the indigenous peoples and nationalities of Ecuador. Next to Mr. Males, Chief Wilton Littlechild, an elder, our elder mentor, to many of us. Grand Chief of Treaty Number Six, former rapporteur of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for two terms, former chair of the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He attended the first World Conference on Indigenous Languages in 2005 and has supported the Indigenous Caucus at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. International Chief Wilton Littlechild had the distinction of being the first Treaty First Nation person to acquire his law degree from the University of Alberta in 76. He received his Bachelor of Physical Education degree in 67 and his Master's degree in Physical Education in 75. In June 2007, the University of Alberta bestowed the Doctor of Laws degree on Chief Littlechild for his outstanding achievements. Chief Littlechild is a respected lawyer and operates the law firm of Wilton Littlechild Barrister and Solicitor. He served as the chairperson for the Commission on First Nations and Métis People and Justice Reform and served also as a member of parliament in Canada from 1988 to 1993 for the riding of Wetakiskin Rimbi. Chief Littlechild organized a coalition of indigenous nations that sought and gained consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the UN. And he served also as a commissioner for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I now turn to 
Ms. Mariam Abu Bakrin, chairperson of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She's a medical doctor from Tombuktu in Mali. She holds a degree from the University of Tizi Uzu in Algeria with several researches in ophthalmology, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics and general medicine. She also holds a master's in humanitarian action from the University of Geneva, focusing on interventions in crisis, armed conflict, marginalization, exclusion, and natural disasters. The latter part of her studies focused on the role of traditional medicine in Tuareg Mali. Mariam is a member of Tin Hinan, a women's association working for the defense promotion and development of indigenous peoples in Africa, in particular the Tuareg. Mariam has been a very active member of this organization since she was young and has worked on many issues related to health, such as nutrition, malaria, prevention and education, on sexual and reproductive health among the Tuareg. She participated in trainings in ILO and several times in the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. We are now having the great honor to have Mariam as the chairperson for a second year at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Next to Mariam Abu Bakrin is Mr. Dmitri Karaka Zaitsev. Dmitri belongs to the indigenous, he's a member of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Dmitri belongs to the indigenous peoples Izora. He has a PhD in law and he has been working in different universities, getting a strong academic background. Currently, he works as practicing lawyer. Meanwhile, Dmitri is a board member of Regional National Cultural Autonomy of Ingrian Finns and a board member of community of the small numbered indigenous people Izora, Shok Yu Kula. Dmitri has ample experience in indigenous issues and interrelations with authorities at multiple levels. Since 1995, he has been engaging with activities devoted to protecting national minorities and indigenous rights, indigenous life environment, support and development of indigenous people's languages and culture. He also has been leading and participating in different international and regional social projects dedicated to, support, to the support of indigenous peoples and he received a major award by the Council of the Kindred Peoples Program in 2015. We are very pleased that Mr. Karaka is here with us. And next to me is my colleague Irmgarda Kassinskaite Budeberg, uh, who is a program specialist working at UNESCO's communication and information sector Knowledge Societies Division in Paris, France. She is in charge of programs related to the promotion of multilingualism in cyberspace, particularly implementing the normative instrument recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and universal access to cyberspace and developing also UNESCO's World Atlas of Languages. She also works on the projects related to access to information, using information and communication technologies for persons with disabilities within the context of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and media and information literacy. She contributed to the implementation of numerous global and regional projects, organization of international events such as World Summit on the Information Society, she contributed to several publications and has written a number of scientific articles. And before joining UNESCO in 2002, she worked as senior program specialist in the Department of Information and Informatics in the Ministry of Public Administration Reforms and Local Authorities in Lithuania. Dr. Imagarda Kasinkaida Budeberg obtained her PhD in communication and information from Vilnius University, a master in information management from Vilnius University as well, and a Bachelor of Arts from Vilnius Academy of Arts. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Mr. Luis Males, thank you.
Thank you. I want to say you to Columbia University, to the Permanent Forum, to our chief, Little Child, and the other guests that's in the, in the main chair. Uh, quiero primeramente agradecer a, a la Columbia University. <coughs> Pedir perdón, disculpa, estoy un poco con la, la voz afónica. Agradecer al Foro Permanente, a todos los presentes, a a nuestro chief que está aquí nos ha contado y son unas palabras que no solamente han pasado en Canadá, sino han pasado en todo el mundo. En ese sentido, eh, voy a empezar mi presentación con unas palabras, unas palabras que son de un pensador quichua y están en quichua, que es mi lengua materna, que dice Yukan Chipak Shimikuna Chingarikpika, Yukan Chipak Kausai Pashmi Tutayangama. Esto quiere decir, si nuestras lenguas desaparecen, anochecerán nuestras vidas. ¿Y esto por qué lo decimos? Porque cuando uno habla de lenguas indígenas, no solo, no solo habla de vehículos de transmisión, vehículos de comunicación, sino habla más allá. Habla de cómo se transmiten nuestras prácticas culturales, hablan cómo se, practica, cómo se transmiten nuestros conocimientos, eh, cómo son nuestras formas de vida. Como nos había dicho el, 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 el antenor ponente, hay muchas palabras que no se pueden traducir en nuestros idiomas. En quichua no existe la palabra progresa. Y cuando nosotros hacemos esa asimilación, o sea, tratamos de, de hacer un acercamiento conceptual en ese sentido. Eh, y hay muchos eh, ejemplos en, en este caso. Eh, y hablando ya, o sea, cuando nosotros qué entendemos como, como justicia, digamos, eh, justicia lingüística es qué está haciendo el Estado ecuatoriano, y es eh, justamente lo que iba a tratar en esta mañana, qué hemos hecho como Estado ecuatoriano eh, en el tema de, la, del tema de las políticas lingüísticas. Eh, primeramente decirles eh, que el Ecuador es un Estado plurinacional e intercultural. Esto lo dice el artículo primero de nuestra Constitución ecuatoriana, también nos indica que reconoce las lenguas indígenas como idiomas oficiales de relación intercultural. Aquí lo reconoce al quicho y el shuar, especialmente, pero no son las únicas lenguas que se hablan en el Ecuador. También eh, garantiza el acceso a una educación, comprensión cultural y lingüística. Aquí hacer un comentario, ¿por qué nosotros siempre, siempre resaltamos el tema de educación? Es porque los sistemas educativos son los principales medios de aculturación, son los principales medios donde la lengua se pierde, donde nuestras costumbres, nuestras prácticas, nuestra espiritualidad van desapareciendo. De este tema decirles, como les había comentado, eh, esto tenemos un, eh, nuestra constitución respalda este tema, nos dice que el Ecuador, como ya he dicho, un estado de, es un estado unitario, pero sí intercultural y pronacional, que reconoce al quicho y el suar como de, eh, o, o idiomas oficiales y los demás idiomas indígenas oficiales, pero en sus territorios. También garantiza que desarrollar, fortalecer y potenciar el sistema de, un, de, el sistema de educación intercultural con criterios de calidad. Esto es muy importante, desde la, desde la estimulación temprana, o sea, desde la primera infancia hasta el nivel superior, hasta la, la universidad, quiere decir esto. <coughs> Y avanzando en el tema, eh, también, también eh, tenemos eh, muchos marcos normativos, especialmente eh, voy a citar el tema de educación, en donde dice que nuestra educación intercultural bilingüe debe tener un criterio propio, debe ser propio de las nacionalidades y debe tener presencia cultural y lingüística. ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Que la lengua principal debe ser las lenguas indígenas, pero aquí decirle que en muchos casos esto no se puede cumplir. Y asimismo decir que por ley, la institución que actualmente represento está creada, que es el Instituto de Idiomas, Ciencias y Saberes Ancestrales, que es una entidad que se ascribe hacia el sistema educativo y tiene que generar muchos procesos, muchos insumos, como es la normación lingüística, tiene que generar, en, digamos, procesos de enseñanza en primera y segunda lengua, en lenguas indígenas, y así una serie de cosas. Eh, y aquí es muy importante, muy importante el sistema de educación intercultural bilingüe, porque aquí tenemos una representación indígena, hay un consejo plurinacional de educación intercultural bilingüe, 
donde las 14 nacionales de, de nacionalidades del Ecuador están presentes. Ellos, eh, digamos, eh, tienen voz en el sistema de cuándo y cómo se implementa la, eh, la política pública en materia de educación y asimismo cómo es el diseño y cómo nosotros vamos implementando. Tenemos otra subsecretaría, que le llamamos así, Subsecretaría de Educación Interculingüe, eh, que en estos dos niveles es donde se asesora, se diseña y se elabora la política pública, pero asimismo tenemos dos niveles operativos. Uno de estos es el Instituto de Idiomas, Ciencias y Ancestrales, en donde nosotros ya aplicamos, aterrizamos la política pública, pero asimismo estos estamos relacionados con lo que tiene que ver con el Sistema Nacional de Cultura, el Sistema de Ciencia, Tecnología, Innovación y Saberes Ancestrales, el Sistema Nacional de Educación Superior y algo muy importante que es el Sistema de Salud. Para seguir avanzando, aquí tenemos una gráfica para que ustedes la puedan visibilizar, cómo están distribuidos nuestros pueblos y nacionalidades. Cuando nosotros hablamos de nacionales, nacionalidades indígenas, nos referimos a cierta manera a dos criterios, que es el, el criterio lingüístico y el criterio territorial. Entonces, yo soy de la nacionalidad quichua y pertenezco al pueblo tabalo. Cuando digo pueblo, tiene que ver una circunscripción territorial, a un espacio geográfico determinado. Pero también, digamos, hay eh, nacionalidades que tienen... Eh, la lengua, pero no tienen territorio, digamos porque son territorios que están muy dispersos y también nosotros tenemos todavía poblaciones indígenas que están, en eh, por ejemplo, en aislamiento voluntario y donde están ellos eh, en sus territorios que son respetados, que no está, digamos, hay franjas territoriales en donde se preserva o se garantiza sus derechos. Eh, nosotros, digamos, en la costa ecuatoriana tenemos a los aguas, tenemos a los chachis, a los éperas, a los sáchilas, a los manta, huancabilca, en la sierra ecuatoriana tenemos a los caranquis, natabuelas o tabalos, es la, el pueblo donde yo vengo, a los cayambis, quitucaras, panzaleos, chibuleos, salazacas, quizapinchas, quichuas de Tunguragua, Guaranga, Puruá, Cañar y Saraguro. Y en la Amazonía, donde tenemos una mayor diversidad, tenemos a los compañeros Cofán, a los hermanos Secoya, Siona, Guaurani, Shibia, Zápara, Ashuar, Shuar, quichuas y Anduas. Entonces, digamos, este es eh, eh, lo que el Ecuador legalmente reconoce a estas nacionalidades, a estos pueblos, pero esto no quiere decir que sean los únicos. Y eso también hay un proceso ahí de, de autorreconocimiento. Entonces, por eso les decía que en el Ecuador se hablan 14 idiomas indígenas en 18 pueblos y 14 nacionalidades. Y aquí algo muy importante, eh, y, al, y algo que no lo dice el Ecuador, sino justamente un estudio que lo hizo la UNESCO, que es del Atlas de las Lenguas del Mundo en Peligro. Aquí vemos en esta gráfica que ninguna de las 14 lenguas del Ecuador tienen, eh, digamos, están eh, completamente con vitalidad. Todas tienen algún, están, tienen algún riesgo de desaparecer, pero tenemos ya una lengua extinta, que es el caso del Andua. En el caso del Andua nosotros tenemos eh, registros eh, sonoros, digamos, que y algunos estudios lingüísticos que nos permitirían recuperar esta lengua, pero eso no quiere decir eh, que los, eh, las personas que pertenecen a esta nación existan. Lo que ha pasado y lo que también pasa en algunos casos es que también las lenguas indígenas son desplazadas por otras lenguas indígenas. En este caso los compañeros o los hermanos Anduas hablan quicho. Hablan quichas, pero cuando uno hace los estudios lingüísticos ve que hay ciertos prestamismos lingüísticos en donde se refleja todavía ciertas palabras de Landua. Pero asimismo tenemos eh, en situación crítica la lengua épera y la lengua zápara. Aquí eh, hace algún tiempo la UNESCO eh, se trabajó con el tema de la lengua zápara, tenemos una declaratoria de patrimonio, pero aquí el, que digamos, el principal hablante eh, que era muy fluente en la lengua que tenía, tenía, manejaba y hablaba perfectamente este idioma, murió hace alrededor de dos años. Todavía nos quedan tres hablantes. Esta lengua es transfronteriza. Esta lengua no solo se habla en el Ecuador, se habla también en el lado peruano, pero hablando con nuestros hermanos del lado peruano tampoco ya no tienen hablantes de ese lado. Eh, nosotros aquí como instituto hemos hecho ya unos... Eh, 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 estudios que lo estamos profundizando, más que nada necesitamos eh, profundizar en, lo, en el tema eh, de morfosintáctico y para tener una mayor o que crear gramáticas que nos permitan de alguna manera eh, construir un método de enseñanza para que ya esto nuevamente se pueda reintroducir en las, eh, en las aulas, digamos, de una forma. Y así, 
tenemos en todo caso en todas las lenguas, digamos que la lengua más fuerte del Ecuador es la lengua del quichua, tenemos alrededor de 700 mil hablantes y esta lengua también es transfronteriza porque se habla en el norte, de, en el sur de Colombia, digámoslo así, eh, en el Ecuador, en Perú, en Bolivia, en el norte de, de Chile y en el norte de Argentina, eh, pero también, también esta lengua está en peligro y seguimos en este, en este proceso. Aquí quería presentar un poco de, de estadística para que ustedes eh, la visualicen. Digamos, si, a nivel nacional, siete de cada diez personas en el área rural hablan una lengua ancestral. ¿ya? Pero esto, cuando lo vemos del otro lado, en los medios urbanos, vemos que la estadística ya baja. Son cinco de cada diez personas que hablan la lengua. ¿Y esto qué ha pasado? Porque justamente esta migración campo-ciudad o la migración eh, también pasa en el Ecuador. Si uno analiza las estadísticas nuevamente, digamos que las mayores concentraciones de población indígena del Ecuador están en Quito y Guayaquil, que son las dos principales ciudades. Nosotros tenemos educación eh, intercultural bingo en esas ciudades, pero quizás, eh, quizás no sea la mejor eh, manera de seguir profundizando o más que nada rehabilitando la lengua, pero eso quiere decir porque también en las ciudades son grandes y están dispersas. Tenemos en Quito, para dar un ejemplo, tenemos alrededor de 10 unidades educativas <coughs> en donde se enseña especialmente el quicha, pero como en estas ciudades se concentran, digamos, las 14 lenguas, llegar eficientemente o manejar las 14 lenguas en una sola unidad educativa, tenemos complicaciones en ese sentido. Y usualmente lo que pasa es que la, la lengua dominante en lenguas indígenas desplaza a las lenguas minoritarias y eso también nos pasa en los campos urbanos. Y aquí otro problema. Cuando uno no alisa ya, digamos, aquí esta gráfica dice población autoidentificada como, como población indígena que habla una lengua ancestral por grupos etarios. Cuando uno, y aquí lo señalo, lo resalto en la gráfica, cuando ve en la edad de 6 hasta 8 años es donde la lengua está desapareciendo. Tenemos menos hablantes, mientras más eh, el niño tiene una menor edad, se va perdiendo la lengua. Y en cambio vemos del otro lado... Eh, los adultos, digamos de 45, 50 años en adelante, son fluentes, manejan la lengua. ¿Pero qué está pasando ahí? Y justamente es uno de los criterios que también nuestro compañero eh, presentó anteriormente, es que la transmisión intergeneracional no está sucediendo. ¿ya? Nuestros abuelos no están transmitiendo la lengua, nuestros niños no están transmitiendo la lengua, nuestros niños están en un sistema educativo en donde la lengua no se está enseñándose, están en contextos urbanos donde ya la cultura no se puede reproducir y no está pasando esto en el caso ecuatoriano. Eso muy difiere mucho ¿no? en el campo rural. Nosotros todavía tenemos, los llamamos territorios puros. Digamos, en el profundo de la Amazonía hay lenguas que se mantienen y son, digamos, hasta monolingües, en donde la gente no habla el idioma oficial, que es el castellano, por ejemplo. Eh, ¿Qué es nosotros? ¿Cómo pensamos esto para ir un poco eh, avanzando en el tema? ¿Cómo por, eh, pensamos un proceso de rehabilitación lingüística y de conocimientos ancestrales? Tenemos un fuerte componente que es participación comunitaria, que lo llamamos, pero eso quiere decir que los propios hablantes participen en esos espacios, que tiene que haber un diálogo de saberes, un diálogo de saberes pero en igualdad de condiciones, porque eso no pasa, la academia con los pueblos indígenas no conversa en igualdad de condiciones, no nos ven como iguales todavía. Tenemos que tener una comunicación, pero una comunicación intercultural. Yo no puedo ir a los pueblos o con los pueblos indígenas y hablarles en una lengua que ellos no entienden. Entonces, el Estado se debe aproximar y darse las maneras de cómo enseñar y aprender como Estado las lenguas. Y más que nada, sensibilizar. Sensibilizar es un tema. Las los pueblos indígenas sabemos por qué es importante preservarlas, conservarlas, revitalizamos, pero tenemos al Estado, tenemos a la academia, tenemos a la sociedad civil que debe entender por qué es importante este proceso. Y esto, lo, ¿cómo lo hacemos? Con investigación para la apropiación y empoderamiento de los conocimientos propios. Esto nos interesa mucho. Es muy diferente escribir como indígena que escribir como académico. Es, eh, y para esto también necesitamos impulsar y promocionar políticas públicas para el desarrollo de los idiomas y saberes de los pueblos y nacionalidades, generar capacidades en los pueblos indígenas. Esto es muy importante. Eh, la ley ecuatoriana indica que todo el, eh, el, al, un, al menos una lengua debe ser incluida en todo el sistema educativo. Para hacer esto no tenemos los suficientes hablantes 
y aún en lenguas que sí las tenemos, no tenemos los suficientes profesionales. Y el otro, como decíamos, en la promoción y el uso de las lenguas. Tenemos ahora eh, en las más media, tenemos las redes sociales y nosotros debemos empezar a escribir en lengua, empezar a comunicarnos. Y en el caso de Ecuador es muy interesante, cuando uno publica ciertas o hace eh, publicación en redes sociales, se, empe se empe empieza a interactuar. Y esto nos sirve mucho para las nuevas generaciones, para los más jóvenes, porque es donde principalmente ellos en, en un teléfono, en un smartphone, empiezan a discutir, se empieza a generar, se empieza a hacer debate. ¿Y para qué esto? ¿Para qué es lo que queremos de esto? Justamente para impulsar mecanismos para la vitalidad de los sistemas de vida de los pueblos de nacionalidades. Cuando hablamos eh, de pueblos de nacionales, tenemos que entender son sistemas complejos, son sistemas diferentes, que todavía la academia no ha podido entendernos y usualmente lo que hace es una eh, eh, traducción, por decirlo así, pero cuando hablamos de idiomas indígenas, nosotros lo que hacemos es una, son aproximaciones, son interpretaciones, y eso es lo que hemos estado trabajando. Y aquí es un tema de que nos preocupa mucho, ¿qué se pierde? No? Cuando uno habla de las repercusiones de la pérdida de una lengua, sabemos que hay muchos saberes que se pierden, eh, sabemos que hay patrones eh, de estructura en la lengua que no se pueden interpretar, que se siguen perdiendo. Eh, tenemos muchas claves para muchas respuestas que quizás desde las sociedades occidentales los podrían usar y sería una gran contribución de los pueblos indígenas. Hay expresiones y textualidades orales que se van perdiendo en este caminar y, y, y lo que más nos preocupa, un pueblo sin lengua es un pueblo que muere. La identidad es la lengua y la identidad de los pueblos y nacionalidades debe conservarse y preservarse. Digamos, para ir cerrando ya, porque dicen que ya me queda dos minutos y creo que me estoy pasando del tiempo, en el Ecuador tenemos un marco constitucional y normativo que es favorable para la justicia indígena, que es favorable para las lenguas indígenas. Aquí tenemos un desafío que el Estado reconoce al Shuaru y al Quichua como idioma oficial, pero ¿qué está pasando? ¿Qué nos falte? ¿Qué nos hace falta reconocer a las demás lenguas indígenas? Tenemos un sistema educativo que tiene presidencia cultural y educativa, pero que no es suficiente. Hay que fortalecerlo, hay que seguirlo trabajando, hay que generar capacidades. Necesitamos generar profesionales que se pueden incluir, profesionales propios de los pueblos nacionales que se van a incluirse, no solo en el sistema educativo, sino en todo el Estado ecuatoriano. Y algo que nos favorece o que necesitamos profundizar, y quizás aquí la UNESCO también nos puede ayudar, necesitamos profundizar en estudios lingüísticos, pero que sean aplicables, que no queden en una bonita universidad, que no estén perchados en una universidad, sino que estén apropiados por los hablantes y que también sean usados por los pueblos indígenas. Y esto sí nos ayudaría sí, a impulsar el desarrollo de las lenguas originarias para su uso en todos los espacios sociolingüísticos. Con esto decirles, eh, Yupaychani, muchas gracias en mi idioma, y también eh, decirles, Taniyomak Asensuk, no sé si lo produjo eh, bien, eso es Shuar, que es otra lengua en el Ecuador. Y decirles de parte del Instituto de Idiomas, Ciencias y Demás Ancestrales, muchas gracias. Yupaychani, señor Males también de nosotros uh, and thank you very much for these very rich experiences that you shared with us from Ecuador. I would now like to invite Mariama Bubakrin. Thank you. Tagalasam. Uh, greetings in Tamashak. Uh, thank you. I would like to acknowledge my elders, uh, our chief uh, Wilton Littlechild and our previous chief who gave uh, the opening words. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge our parliamentarians who are here um, and uh, the, all the professors, uh, uh, students who uh, have a high interest on indigenous languages and on indigenous issues in uh, general. Uh, I would like also to, also to recognize and to thank um, uh, the two uh, big ladies, um, uh, uh, Professor Liu and uh, Professor Stamatopoulos, 
for their uh, leading on that and for uh, having us today uh, coordinating with the other partners like uh, UNESCO as well as the Secretariat of the Permanent Forum and with all over who uh, uh, make it possible today. Uh, and at least, um, not at least uh, the University of Columbia through the two institutes who opened us uh, its doors. So uh, just uh, to begin, um, I would like to refer to one uh, thought said by National Indian Brotherhood. Uh, language is the outward expression of an accumulation of learning and experience shared by a group of people over centuries of development. It is not only simply a vocal symbol, it is dynamic force which shapes the way a man looks at the world, his thinking about the world and his philosophy of life. Knowing this maternal Knowing his maternal language helped uh, a man to know himself. Uh, being proud of his language helps a man to be proud of himself. This means that language, languages are not limited only to the communication as it has been already said by uh, my predecessor speakers, uh, uh, to which they are often only associated to. They are also the main vehicle of a story, a way of reflecting and conveying, uh, conceiving the world. Sometimes they are the only lifeline in our culture. So uh, today I will uh, have only time to present uh, the, uh, the linkage of, uh, or the place as pillar of language in, uh, for our cultures. And then I will briefly present you the work of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for languages, uh, Indigenous Languages Promotion, Preservation, and Revitalization. As it has been said in the opening words by the Chief Clara, uh, keep language is keep, keeping language is keeping people who speak that language uh, culture alive. Of all the symbolic structure that contribute to conferring our identity, such as civilization, religion, literature, history, and what we uh, may call the permanence of existence, it is the language that occupy a preeminent rank. The mother tongue is in a way our collective memory and is undoubtedly closely linked to our existence as it has been said by Jürgen Orber. Similarly, uh, Josie Martinez Kobe, Kobo sorry, uses languages, uh, language among the main criteria for defining indigenous peoples. And uh, among these, uh, there are some who identify, I mean these indigenous peoples, th there are some who identify themselves only by uh, their language. This is the example of my people, the Tuareg, who do not designate themselves by the word Tuareg, but uh, by uh, the word Kaltamashak, that means those who speak uh, the, the Tamashak language. So the language connects uh, the identity. In addition, language is a bridge between generations, as it has been mentioned earlier. It allows access to past messages. Therefore, it is a mean of transmission of culture and its expression. There are indigenous cultures that cannot be faithfully translated into other languages once they lose their meaning. And the contrary is uh, right also, as it has been said by Chief, when uh, they wanted to explain a Western or a, a French or English uh, 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 term in the language, it has no means in uh, indigenous languages. So one example from my own uh, language uh, or culture is Ashik, a Tuareg cultural value that is a kind of modesty uh, that does not make sense when it's just said in another language other than Tamashak and out of the Tuareg context. Hence, for the, this notion to be passed, 
on to community members, especially children, they must be conveyed in indigenous uh, languages. Thus, languages is a connecting factor between members of a community. Not only uh, does language as a barrier of a vision of the world, culturally unite uh, members of the same linguistic community, but it uh, also allows that shared vision to be transmitted from generation to generation. The union of individuals thus goes beyond the circle of real community of the living ones. By transmitting the cultural heritage, language makes it possible to link uh, present generation to past and to the futures, to the future. In addition, for some indigenous peoples with mental health and consumers' issues um, uh, as a result of acculturation and assimilation policies, the indigenous languages and the teaching they teach uh, contribute to build, uh, uh, to build strong personalities and res resilience. And as it has been said by um, Chief uh, Wilton Little, I take away a language is take away, uh, take away a language to children is take away uh, from them their identity and their self-esteem. So languages are an attractive resource for programs responding to the great challenge of promoting mental health in some indigenous communities. Now I'm going to share with you some of the work uh, of the Permanent Forum on the Languages. Since the establishment of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the situation of indigenous languages has been a major issue on our agenda. The forum has made more than 92 recommendations to the UN system, member states urging them to take concrete action to promote, protect, and revitalize indigenous languages. We have organized two separate ex international expert group meetings that uh, uh, Chief Willie Little Child referred to, one in 2008 and the second one more recently in 2016. The Permanent Forum International Expert Group meeting on the team indigenous languages preserves, preservation and revitalization, referring to Article 13, 14, and 16 of the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples, organized by UNDESA, aim was to propose recommendations to states, the United Nations system, in particular UNESCO, indigenous peoples and other partners to foster synergies for the survival, revitalization, use, and promotion of indigenous languages to advance the rights of indigenous peoples. In the Permanent Forum 15 session report in the same year, some of the recommendations from uh, the expert group meeting on languages were adopted, in particular at the paragraph 11, the Permanent Forum recommends that the General Assembly by 2020 proclaim an international year of indigenous languages and draw attention to the critical loss of indigenous languages and the urgent need to preserve, revitalize, and promote indigenous languages and to take further urgent steps at the uh, national and international level. That conducted to the UN General Assembly adoption of the uh, Resolution A-71-481 and in this regard, as Equator is here, I would like to thank them for the lead that they took uh, in, to advance that um, uh, recommendation uh, through the third committee to become the, uh, that resolution and where the paragraph 13 states, um, the state proclaim, the, sorry, the UN General Assembly proclaims the year beginning on 1st January 2019, the International Year of Indigenous Languages, 
to draw attention to the critical loss of indigenous languages and the urgent need to preserve, revitalize, and promote indigenous languages and to take further urgent steps at, at the national and international level. So I will not read all the, um, all the um, uh, resolution, but it's the follow-up of our recommendation. And last year, during the Permanent Forum annual session, uh, UNESCO held a consultation on the 2019 International Year of Indigenous Languages, and we devoted uh, this paragraph of our report that year uh, as it states, the Permanent Forum recommends that UNESCO, in cooperation with the Expert Mechanism on Indigenous Peoples, UN Permanent Forum, and Special Rapporteur on Indigenous People, and with the full participation of Indigenous people, develop a comprehensive action plan for the International Year and invite UNESCO to submit the plan to the forum at its 17th session. And uh, we are happy that um, uh, on Tuesday, um, UNESCO presented us the action plan and uh, had a lot of hearing we, during the uh, session of this session of forum to uh, have a, a, an agreed uh, action plan. I will not go in depth on that. I'm sure that uh, Imgarda will come back on it. Finally, the UN Permanent Forum continues to use the social media, including UN uh, media, to raise awareness, urgent need to promote, protect, and revitalize indigenous languages. The survival of indigenous languages need a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder commitment. And I call on indigenous peoples, member states, academics, private sector, including media for a joint work for an effective impact of the International Year of Indigenous Languages 2019 so that every indigenous person can have the privilege. It's a right, but I call it privilege because it's a privilege now to express herself in her language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Abubakrin, and now Mr. Karaka. Yeah, uh, almost. Uh, good morning. I have uh, time is running here. This is the clock, and so I have to be first. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the inviting me, and uh, for me it's a uh, great pleasure to be here because I have graduated in one from one of the. Uh, university uh, from university in St. Petersburg and uh, as I remember uh, the Columbia University is a partner of uh, my uh, alma mater in St. Petersburg so uh, I graduated pedagogical university but I'm a lawyer so it's kind of a very strange combination uh, so uh, uh, I just want to make a bridge from uh, uh, the speech of my colleague Mariam uh, to some kind of uh, points I would like to share with you and uh, to make a reference uh, to the uh, previous uh, recommendations of uh, 16th session uh, of uh, permanent forum and uh, one of the recommendations which I consider is very important uh, this time uh, now, for, 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 for nowadays is the recommendation number 14 which uh, say that uh, Permanent Forum uh, urged the states, uh, the, the member states, to incorporate in their state uh, educational system uh, the system of uh, uh, preparation the uh, indigenous languages teachers uh, in, in, in accordance with the initiative of, of indigenous uh, peoples. Why this recommendation was introduced, uh, successfully introduced uh, to uh, the final document uh, is because uh, in the many countries, uh, the indigenous people communities do not have uh, the opportunity, I'm not talking about the funds and uh, finances, they don't have an, uh, resources, the human resources to develop the language. They, many of communities, even they are, sell, e even they are strongly identified themselves, uh, like, for example, Ijora people, 
uh, Isoria people is in Russia. It's a, 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 a Russified name of my people, Isoria. Uh, we called ourselves Inkeroiset. So we are Inkeroiset, but we do not speak our language. And uh, we cannot be uh, accused or blamed uh, that we are not fluently native speakers because our language was uh, cleaned uh, from the language history uh, in, uh, uh, since 1937 uh, during the Soviet time. So, uh, and only nowadays we are trying to do uh, all our best uh, to return back to the language. So our self-identification uh, self uh, does not uh, based on the language identity. And I think that for many people, for many indigenous people in uh, Russia and in uh, Eastern Europe, in uh, Northern Europe, uh, it's, the history is more or less the same. So that's why this uh, recommendation was introduced uh, to our final document. Uh, what can we do uh, on the different levels? I can make. I, I would like uh, to have a reference uh, to my colleague, uh, professor of uh, Tartu University from Estonia, uh, Professor Heinike Heinso, uh, who is uh, one of the leader in. Uh, I think. I think she is a leader. Uh, in revitalizing of Votian language. Votian language is the uh, language of Finno-Ugric group. Uh, Votian people are my like my relatives of our people of Inkeroiset. So, uh, uh, in accordance with the census of uh, two, uh, yeah, 2010 census, uh, we have only uh, 64 uh, people. Of this, uh, I mean, of this, of this nation, and only uh, le less than ten people are native speakers. So, uh, and what she is doing is uh, she is coming. Uh, first of all, she is uh, working in academic uh, environment. So she is producing books and uh, vocabularies. Uh, and she uh, made uh, courses in the village. She's coming to this uh, small village and delivers some, some, uh, making summer camps uh, for the children and for old people who would like to uh, remember and refresh uh, the knowledge of uh, the, the mother tongue. So, but, and uh, I would like to say that, as, as Heinike Henso says, that there are two levels of uh, language. Uh, revitalization process, micro, micro and macro level. And on micro level, we are, doing, we are doing everything we can. We are using all kind of tools. We are working with the children in the family, within the family. We are uh, trying to give them the knowledge, not only about the language, but about uh, the, our special uh, features and uh, traditions, and uh, we try to go with them, I don't know, to the forest, uh, to play with them, to dance with, the, with them. But then uh, what, what, who, who is helping, uh, who, who are helping us? Of course, the pe uh, people from the universities. And uh, this is a micro level. It is very active, but the, on macro level, it's a state level. It's a level of the state educational system. And uh, for example, our people, like Inkeroiset, Vatyalaiset, uh, and I think that most of the people, they are not receiving the support from the state educational system. Uh, so uh, I cannot see uh, any sincerity or respect nowadays in some particular countries, to the uh, to the indigenous people, indigenous languages. Uh, so I would like to call. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you will have uh, some kind of recommendation. Uh, I would like to recall to this uh, to our recommendation, uh, which we made uh, on the sixteenth uh, session. Uh, uh, regarding the incorporation uh, of the uh, preparation of indigenous languages teachers for indigenous people. Uh, 
they could be uh, from community, or, uh, or it could be the people even from other countries who are interested in the language, but they have to be professional teachers. The elders cannot, do not have uh, methodics and uh, how to uh, teach the young generation. Sometimes we are trying to do it, but the young generations, it, it, we have now new young generations, and we need to motivate them and to uh, explain why they have to know uh, the language. This is also a kind of the uh, difficulty. And also the neologisms, it's also the very important issue, how to introduce new uh, words to the, uh, to, uh, how to make your language, the language of your grandmother, uh, to, to, for, for, yeah, how to incorporate it to the nowadays. Because this is kind of a challenge. And I would like to say, uh, to say uh, that in Russian Federation there are some group of young people, of Finno-Ugric uh, people, uh, first of all, Mari people. They, are very, uh, they, they have a very good practices of introducing the neologisms in the modern uh, Mari language. So I'm, I have to finish, yes? I just want to say another recommendation that I would like uh, to uh, ask uh, academical uh, people from ac academic environment, please reconsider your approach to the indigenous languages. Uh, stop only archiving language. Please take all your records and ar from archives and bring uh, as a vocabulary, as a school book, as a methodical book, as a manual for to the community or uh, make, uh, like, grow up the teacher for the community. So, thank you. Sure, passivo. Thank you very much, and I hope that as many of you will give me your own language uh, how you say thank you, because I have a long, uh, wonderful collection that I share with everybody afterwards. Uh, so now uh, I would like to um, invite Imgarda Kasimkaite. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. This one is better? Okay. Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Columbia University, to dear professors for this kind invitation, uh, inviting UNESCO to join and share some ideas and experience and future plans. I would like as well uh, to welcome Chief Little, um, Wilton, Wilton, uh, Little Child, as well my colleagues from um, uh, UNESCO, um, excellencies from um, uh, permanent uh, missions to United Nations, chair of the permanent forum, uh, member of the forum, as well as um, uh, the director from uh, Ecuador Institution, and as well all students here present. Uh, so thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, and uh, as I'm the last speaker before lunch, I'll try to do my best to be quick. <laughs> and, um, and I hope I've, I have um, at least 10 minutes to, to go. So I would like to start uh, with reference to the uh, United Nations um, Universal Declaration on the Human Rights. We already have learned uh, earlier today what... Um, um, what, um, it was a made reference to the, to the declaration what everyone is entitled to the rights and freedoms to set forth in this declaration, including uh, languages. And um, later this year we'll celebrate the uh, 70th anniversary of this declaration and we could see clearly that after 70 years still there are many linguistic communities uh, where the linguistic rights are not fully recognized, and it means that we have still a lot of work to do. But at the same time, uh, we have a number of um, international normative instruments, and I know that you won't see them very well here, 
but I thought that it is important to list uh, what there are some international normative instruments which are, not, uh, which are binding nature and those which are uh, recommending nature, which are linked to uh, linguistic rights. Unfortunately, we cannot say that there is no one single which would be dedicated um, exclusively to the cultural um, uh, linguistic rights um, of any uh, social groups. And uh, at UNESCO, we have a recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and access to cyberspace, which is a recommendation 2003. You see a little bit at the bottom. And that's probably the only um, recommendation which actually provides clear recommendations to member states. Uh, to take concrete actions in terms of promotion multilingualism with special focus um, uh, in cyberspace. Uh, so why UNESCO is involved in International Year of Indigenous Languages and in general um, uh, working in the area of linguistic um, and, uh, and cultural diversity? Uh, we believe that um, what our societies have to be uh, constructed around human rights and human needs. And there are certain key principles as pluralism, inclusion, diversity, openness and participation should be ensured for all social groups, including indigenous people. And we emphasize as well that um, uh, but new uh, vision of knowledge societies, what we promote, is built on four uh, major pillars, education for all, uh, cultural and linguistic diversity, access to information and knowledge and freedom of expression. And that makes sure that we are able to ensure intergenerational uh, inter transmission uh, from one generation to another using all means and tools available around us. So the role of uh, languages in society, uh, if I can see it very well, is it? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. So we have many definitions what language means. Uh, there are a lot of academic discussions, papers, reports written by our colleagues at UN system level, uh, regional levels, and we may have uh, different approaches. Um, uh, very often we looked at languages as human heritage, we as well look as, at local uh, knowledge system, uh, communication system, and probably for, the, uh, for this meeting I would like to emphasize what we see as well, we, um, languages as a strategic national, regional, or, and global resource, which affects quality of life, uh, professional occupation, and all our participation in society of all stakeholders around. And this is what is important to see what as a strategic resource it has to be ref, um, uh, managed, it has to be as well promoted, and all necessary resources are given uh, for the speakers uh, to continue using those languages. Um, I would like to give you a few examples uh, why we believe that a language matters uh, for development, mm -hmm. why a language is a strategic uh, national resource, a global resource. And the uh, first one comes from Africa. Uh, a few years ago, we, uh, of course, have heard all of us um, around the world from mass communication channels, social media, a ball explosion in Africa. And um, recently, we came across with an interesting report, which was not prepared by UN, but by civil society, which actually acknowledged that um, Ebola crisis was a language crisis because a lot of humanitarian information was provided in dominant languages, in English, French. And um, those communities which live in, in those territories, of course, we were not uh, fluent in those dominant languages. So a lot of preventive information, life essential information was not provided in um, local languages. Uh, the second example what I have is, comes from Latin America, Central America as well, and Caribbean. And we could see it as well um, on your right side. Um, the countries, the map which uh, shows territories and countries in Americas with active Zika uh, virus transmission, one which is in more like a violet, a lila color. And on the um, left side, we see UNESCO Atlas of Languages in Danger. And I would say you can imagine as well what it's a similar uh, situation as it was in the Ebola crisis, what a lot of information was provided, again, in major languages. And those communities were not uh, really able to take uh, concrete um, and effective measures to protect themselves from, from active Zika virus in those territories. Um, 
Another example I would like to share as we speak about justice is um, um, information that we found from International Association of Professional Translators and Interpreters. And you can see it clearly what those territories which are marked in gray and of course can be what situation has changed um, recently in some of those countries, but we could see it, what if there are no officially certified interpreters in those territories, it means what local communities will not be represented at equal basis with um, others in the court system, in the legal system. And that is what is a huge issue, and it could be one of the recommendations what in, during international or um, let's say regional and national um, legal cases, what um, um, those uh, speakers who um, do not have a certifi certified uh, interpreters, translators, uh, would have the support and, and somehow would be ensured a uh, equal um, participation and as well uh, defense during those cases. Um, last example, it is a multilingualism in the internet. Um, we could see it very clearly what, uh, what are the dominant languages. Um, uh, situation doesn't change uh, a lot if we look from 2010 to 2013. Of course, today we are 2018 and there are certain changes. We could see what Arabic language is picking up on the internet. Uh, we could see as well there is a difference in Spanish. But what it actually concerns us the most is the, um, what you could see the bar in yellow, which indicates all the rest. It means what there is not a huge um, uh, actually increase in terms of um, presence of indigenous languages, languages in danger, languages which are uh, which are less uh, have um, uh, speakers, uh, lesser speakers, or uh, under resourced, um, uh, are represented uh, well in cyberspace. So it means what um, participation in uh, electronic economy, um, participation in uh, a new society where technology is driving um, is a driving force would be very limited for many communities around the world and special attention should be taken uh, to ensure that those languages um, are well represented. So what it brings us to the next, what we believe that uh, language loss or lang language endangerment affects all the spheres of our life, personal, cultural, scientific, uh, political and economic. And, um, and UNESCO since uh, several decades uh, has been involved in uh, mapping linguistic diversity around the world. Some of you might know that uh, we had uh, several important reports. We have as well online version of the uh, Atlas of Languages in Danger, and, um, which currently includes 2,680 languages in danger. And I'll show you very quickly uh, some uh, statistical data. Um, in 2015, uh, UNESCO uh, proposed to create an atlas of, of world atlas of languages, including as well those which are safe languages and even dominant because um, communities around the world, they live in different territories and we are facing different situations. So even those which um, probably we would not believe would, would have uh, difficulties in their communities, speaking dominant languages might have in certain situations as well. So that gives a much more broader perspective about linguistic diversity around the world. Uh, so last year we exported our data set from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Atlas of Languages in Danger and we could see it and we can firmly uh, say today what if we take 6,700 languages around the world as a let's say indicative number, 40% of languages which are in orange, in orange color indicates what we are in danger and most of them are indigenous languages. 60% means in blue um, safe or no data available. And we anticipate that this, uh, this 60 percent, it's really small number, it's probably 10, 20. Uh, we, we cannot say it today, but it means that really uh, we have to map and, and uh, linguistic diversity around the world together uh, because uh, it just gives one indicator 40 percent, but we anticipate that this number it's much more higher. What is um, interesting as well, what uh, most languages which are in danger have fewer than 10,000 speakers. It means what, um, and you can see it here, 1,720 um, languages listed on our atlas have less than uh, 10,000 speakers. It means what the intergenerational transmission uh, uh, could be challenged, maybe not in all cases, but it means what um, 
this, this is a strong indicator of what a lot of efforts have to be taken to make sure that those smaller communities would have resources and, and necessary support. Um, here, just a perspective, but uh, during our last year, uh, during, uh, during last years, we added another 109 languages to the atlas, and it it's shows a clear, uh, stable increasement of endangerment in number of languages that we inscribe in our atlas. Um, another interesting example, uh, data what we have, but uh, there are countries where um, language is in danger, actually concerns a very big population um, at national level. And there are countries where um, the linguistic diversity is very large, but it concerns a very small number of population. And it means that political level, it's not interesting to draw attention uh, when you have a very small uh, community um, uh, to, uh, to the policy makers, because um, in countries like we see Bolivia, Peru, uh, Russian Federation, um, the uh, numbers and uh, the linguistic diversity is much more higher, so we, we would presume that we, at policy level there is more attention in other countries where the community is very, very small or number is very small of language speakers, uh, it could be difficult to draw attention and mobilize uh, necessary resources. So that should be taken into consideration as well when we organize the international year, but it could be very different situations and, and one size, one type of practice would not fit all. So we need to have some kind of a personalized um, approach to, to different cases. Uh, so um, I know what it was made reference to uh, UNESCO's language um, uh, vitality index. Uh, just to let you know what we are revising it, uh, since uh, 2015, we are working on new methodology and uh, we will be uh, calling member states to provide us official data on uh, languages spoken in their territories which are officially recognized. That's the first step and then gradually we'll move to those which are not recognized in order to provide more comprehensive overview about linguistic diversity. And there is a clear shift uh, of paradigm from engagement, uh, safeguarding languages, to sustainability and empowerment of uh, linguistic communities. Uh, so uh, the Future Atlas will, will be an online platform. We will be inviting um, academic institutions, communities, um, as well um, state level organizations to share with us data. Uh, we could see it very clearly what there are many, um, especially academic institutions which maintain um, archives um, uh, huge resources, uh, which it was already referred by previous speakers, uh, documentary resources, and we would like to suggest that we would open up, that we would share it as an open uh, scientific um, content to the world population, and that um, this could be done through an open platform where we would have more comprehensive overview. There are different stakeholders uh, which map uh, linguistic diversity around the world, but uh, there are clear differences and of course it's better that we would work together instead of separately and, um, and that would help us to formulate more comprehensive systematic um, uh, policies, strategies, plans as well as convince uh, policy makers at different levels uh, what measures are, uh, need to be taken. So, uh, coming back to internationally of indigenous languages, so uh, we are very pleased that we have already a logo, so you can see it. Here will be very soon a website launched, and I invite you, all of you, to, uh, to become members of that community, online community. Um, it won't be hosted at UNESCO, so you won't be bound to our copyright-related uh, issues. It will be a collaborative platform where uh, partners are invited to share information about upcoming events, resources, um, uh, seek and, and identify new partnerships, uh, form new uh, initiatives, dialogues, and, and, and do other, uh, let's say, online-related work which could lead to improvement, improvement of international cooperation. Because we should see it international year as a huge opportunity as it is one of the um, mechanisms for international cooperation and um, it is all together, we all have to work together in order to make a success. Um, UNESCO is, was suggested to lead the, the process, but at the same time we see our role as a facilitator. Uh, and um, we invite um, all stakeholders to join this effort. 
as already chair of the forum said what we uh, presented earlier this week the action plan uh, we uh, we had a number of consultations in new york in geneva in paris we as well had a peer review with different stakeholders and um, the document was submitted to the forum uh, it is available in six UN languages, so you could study this, uh, this document. It is a guiding document. It is a living document which we believe um, uh, will be uh, slightly modified, adapted, a work plan established. Uh, but the key elements are what we have, um, we contribute to, your, uh, to implementation of UN resolution, um, as well as uh, relevant international normative instruments. It has as well a guiding framework um, built on the multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, we as well suggest to have um, um, kind of coordination mechanisms which would be composed of steering committee, and that would include uh, member states, um, representatives of uh, regional uh, social cultural organizations of indigenous peoples, uh, UN free party mechanism and, and UN agencies. And um, uh, we are glad to acknowledge that uh, there are four member states which already acknowledge and we committed uh, to, to work together with us. UNESCO uh, invited elect, uh, regional electoral groups to nominate one country. So we know today what Australia, Ecuador, Estonia and Saudi Arabia are those four countries. We are expecting two more regions to confirm. Uh, we as well, uh, by the end of the forum, um, I believe what uh, indigenous communities as well will nominate the regional rep uh, representatives who will be able not to be just exclusive members, but those who will communicate back to much more broader um, a group of uh, indigenous people. What are the opportunities? What are the issues coming up from the steering committee? What, uh, what are the uh, new aspects which could be taken into consideration and what needs to be done? And um, having said that, when we propose as well to establish ad hoc groups, it could be uh, academics, it could be media professionals, it could be private sector, uh, um, dedicated to specific issues. And of course, all partners are welcome to join the initiative. So uh, there are key principles, what, what I listed uh, on the screen. And uh, there are key elements, um, including major objectives, three thematic areas which were identified uh, during the consultative process, five main, uh, main areas of intervention. Um, we as well uh, tried to identify what it would be the impact of the year, key outputs and participation modalities. Uh, so um, as soon as the website is launched, I invite you to use it. Uh, to inform about your intentions, you express your intentions to work together. Um, and um, we hope that we will be able to have a more systematic, coordinated approach how the International Year will be organized. So if you plan any activities next year, you already have some projects in place, uh, please consider whether International Year would be one uh, which could be as well on your radar and uh, contribute to, to its implementation. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I wish you a successful symposium. Um, I would like to thank you very much from the heart from this, for this amazing and encouraging, I think, and inspiring for all of us. Um, putting together of all the elements and what the other speakers were bringing in, the importance of data, the importance of knowledge, and also of networking and being together on this huge effort that we all need to do. I don't know if my, my colleague, Professor Liu, allows me to, to five minutes, a few minutes, to share some questions from the audience with our panelists. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you. Okay, we are very happy about it. So uh, I would like to see some hands here uh, from our participants. Uh, Doña Otilia. Oh, mic. We need a mic microphone para.
Muy buen día a cada uno de ustedes. Eh, felicitaciones aquí a la universidad, pero particularmente a nuestra maestra Elsa por esta iniciativa tan importante como antecedente para el Año Internacional de las Lenguas Indígenas. Muy interesante. Y qué bueno que se haga en esta universidad, porque la universidad con sus académicos puede impulsar muchísimo, ¿verdad? Entonces, creo que voy a hacer un comentario, un comentario eh, desde nuestra, eh, nuestro sentir, nuestra visión y desde prácticamente nuestras formas de vida. Como he de saber, nosotros tenemos eh, los pueblos indígenas una historia muy similar en cuanto a lo que somos, ¿no? Pero no me voy a dedicar a lo que somos, sino a lo que llegó como agresión. En este caso, podemos recordar el colonialismo y que se ha perpetuado aún con nuevas formas, pero que el colonialismo persiste en nuestros países y en nuestros pueblos. Yo creo que en ese sentido, cuando nosotros hablamos del colonialismo, sí ha habido exterminio. El exterminio de la lengua o del idioma, como ha sucedido en todos los países, pero pronunciadamente, como lo ha explicado el hermano Willy. Esa comisión de la verdad es para que nunca vuelva a suceder y que el Estado canadiense, como los demás estados, tiene la obligatoriedad de reparar a los pueblos indígenas. Este año que viene para la ley, esto, las lenguas indígenas, sí debemos de pedir reparación de los estados, firmemente, pero que nos ayuden los, las universidades, porque aquí es el, la casa de estudios y que los estudios no sean solamente para graduarse, sino que los estudios sirvan para proyectar social, política y económicamente y que encaminemos una reparación de la humanidad para quienes han cometido este tipo de exterminios y delito de genocidio, ecocidio y todo lo que nosotros estamos viviendo. Yo creo que esta, este tipo de eventos nos sirve a todos para reafirmar conciencia y para también pedir y solicitar recomendaciones. Conozco la UNESCO, fui parte del Consejo Ejecutivo de la UNESCO por parte de mi país, Guatemala, y sé cómo es, digamos, los, eh, las actividades anuales de la UNESCO y como es el organismo especializado de la educación, la ciencia y la cultura, hoy la UNESCO debe invitar a los ministros de educación para conocer allá en París, donde está la, la sede, para ver qué están haciendo, cuáles son sus políticas educativas de revitalización, de ir insertando la educación intercultural bilingüe o la educación bilingüe intercultural, como se llama en otros países, en su sistema, en su currículum, en sus políticas porque la, la educación es la rectora de la política, del sistema que tenemos en nuestros países. Entonces, la UNESCO tiene que hacer una invitación a los ministros de Educación, a los ministros de Cultura y a las de Ciencia y Tecnología para ver cómo están transmitiendo, cómo están usando las TICs, por ejemplo. Entonces, yo creo que mucho que hacer y, por otro lado, el foro permanente que considero que ya lo debe tener contemplado, pero como una recomendación yo les diría que colocaran ese tema especial para el próximo año, para que los pueblos indígenas eh, abordemos también procesos de revitalización de nuestro idioma, como también lo que ha antecedido para su exterminio, porque sí es legítimo. Creo que tenemos el derecho de la libre expresión y tenemos que hacerlo y decirlo. Y creo que tenemos que también eh, tener una estrategia, pueblos indígenas y académicos, pueblos indígenas y Estado, para ver cómo también se hace una estrategia a nivel del mundo y que tengamos escritas nuestras lenguas en las Naciones Unidas, en la UNESCO, y que nos, y que nos veamos, por lo, menos, por lo menos que se diga bienvenidas y bienvenidos en todos los idiomas del mundo. Creo que sería muy importante y que iniciáramos nuestros eh, discursos con una introducción de nuestros idiomas. Perdonen, hice la, la de, ¿cómo se llama? Mi intervención muy larga, pero tenía que hacer estos análisis políticos y que por otro lado, pues estamos en este proceso y camino de sentirnos seres humanos, los pueblos indígenas, somos seres originarios y que tenemos el pleno derecho 
del ejercicio de la lengua y de nuestros derechos, sobre todo el consentimiento libre, previo e informado, la tierra y el territorio y los recursos naturales. Muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you. Um, my name is Lori Johnston. My people are Yamasi, and we're a small numbered indigenous peoples with a critically endangered language. And we've been participating at the permanent forum. This is the third forum where we've been in the Indigenous Languages Caucus. The first time we've even seen an action plan. And um, we are trying to get more information, and we're working with other indigenous peoples who are saying the same thing. And many indigenous peoples with critically endangered languages do not even know about free prior and informed consent. So thank you for the map about the, the court interpreters, uh, because the you know to get the legal concepts into the language is the first priority. But is there an email that we can, um, maybe you have a young associate who can just answer emails and direct people to who we are supposed to talk to about this. Indigenous peoples have been organized to participate with UNESCO for three years now. And then we hear in the forum yesterday that indigenous peoples are not ready. And so there's a miscommunication. We are already organized by our languages, our language groupings. And then we come here and suddenly in one day we are supposed to reorganize the whole indigenous language world into the UNESCO region. So we're trying to do that, but it goes up in the reports and it comes out the other end of ECOSOC reports that indigenous peoples are not competent or capable to even uh, plan the indigenous languages years. So we think um, the, the many indigenous language ambassadors here um, for showing excellency to the UN. Um, so. Uh, Chief Littlechild mentioned the Indigenous Languages Day. There is upcoming the Mother Tongue Day at the UN. So maybe that is a way to bring that forward. So we rely on your excellencies, our Indigenous Languages ambassadors, to bring this forward. Okay, I would like to take. I would like to take a couple of more, and then uh, our panelists will wrap up. Thank you. Um, I'm learning a lot, um, and this symposium, and I have um, uh, three questions. And the first one for, um, I think most of uh, your speech has to do with legality, with law, and normative things, and how to advance and within the framework of endangered languages. And I was wondering about key concepts such as interculturality and bilingualism. And interculturality in Latin America, particularly in the Andes, is being used as a code word to disappear the language. So that is the case of Peru, for example. They use a lot of the, the language, the, the lexicon of intercultural education, in intercultural education, intercultural for everybody, and so on and so forth. But the main goal of that kind of education is precisely to assimilate Quechua speakers and Aymara speakers into the framework of Spanish language. So there are statistics now. Uh, telling us, oh, and this is the number of schools in, we, in which we are teaching in Aboriginal languages. However, they start in the first, second grade, and they, they restart the transition model that goes, uh, that is taught by the sixth grade, and by the, in the middle and high school, no longer the language is taught. Huh? And so, in the case of Ecuador, it calls my attention because I did an evaluation of bilingual education in Ecuador uh, regarding Quechua and Spanish. And it was interesting to know that I don't know the status right now in the ground, in the field. No? One is the legal thing, one is the legal thing, the constitution, the normative things, but 
what is the situation, the current situation on the ground? No? And then I would like to go to the issue of translation that one of the speakers highlighted, the problem of how we translate certain concepts into the dominant language, such as English, such as French, or, or Portuguese, or Spanish. No? Uh, it's true, there are no other languages. Uh, there is no an equivalent. So we are always in debating how we translate this concept. And so maybe we would like to think you know, that certain frameworks, certain conceptual frameworks are definitely uh, difficult to translate because we are positioned in two different paradigms. You know? And these paradigms doesn't match with the English paradigm or the French paradigm, with the tradition how knowledge is constructed. No, it has to do with epistemi, with epistemology. But also the second point is that through the language, language is a key player in the process of formulating how the world, how the world it is, how people constitute the world, and the why the world is constituted um, uh, is different in English, it's different in French, no? and different in Quechua, for example. No? Um, then I would like to go with the issue of respect and sincerity. No? Calls my attention deeply because precisely on the ground, on the field, in Latin America there is no respect in regard to indigenous language. What is going on is a process of racializing those who speak any indigenous language and who supposedly, according to the dominant um, language speakers, such as Spanish, supposedly those indigenous people who, ha uh, who have learned the dominant language, such as Spanish, speak with a certain kind of accent that is not acceptable by the elites, by the middle class. No? Just like here, if we contrast the situation of Spanish language in the context of the United States, it's regarded as a minority language, it's discriminated. If you talk with certain, uh, supposedly uh, think of Spanish uh, accent, you are not speaking proper English. So that is, um, I think these things, from my perspective, should be taken into account because otherwise, how we can change peoples? It's not that indigenous people have to care about their language also has to do with major frameworks, how the people who are empowered, how those who speak the dominant language can change their mindset and what we can do for that. No? And so you may be wondering which what authority you are speaking here. I am a Quechua speaker from my golden cradle. Uh, thank you very much for bringing also in the social, the deep social meaning of language justice. Hi, I wanted to first thank and hello to Elsa. <clears throat> Just mention very shortly um, the acknowledgement to what I heard from Mariam, Abukari, uh -huh, and Dimitri. Putting it very short, I think it's important to understand that language is a right. It's not a favor, it's not something that is a fashion, it is a right. And I think that's one of the main things that I understood from Mariam. And from Dimitri, I think it's important, and I'm going to echo it with something that I do in my, in my endeavor as a language rights advocate, which is people have to respect the language, and they also have to respect the speakers. Because I know many people that like the languages, run away with the language after they have uh, recorded it, and become an expert on the language and despise the speakers. And that is dividing. It's like taking away your spirit. And that has to end. Okay? And I, I, I'm, I'm going to do a presentation now. And, and we are a 6,000 um, and more uh, Facebook group on uh, language rights that I started like three years ago. And that's the main um, reflection that people write from all over the world. Okay? That they feel that people come 
and they sort of take control of their language, become experts, and then they don't even mention them. Okay, not to talk about the, the financing of that. How many projects are being financed, and, the speak, and that doesn't really arrive to the communities at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I would like to invite our panelists to share some final thoughts based on the, uh, the questions and comments in the room. Sí, nada más, eh, creo que hubo una pregunta para el tema del caso ecuatoriano. Eh, yo había terminado mi presentación en decir de que hay muchos avances, pero lo que hay es más desafíos. Eh, nosotros eh, tenemos, estamos conscientes de las deficiencias en el sistema educativo, pero eso es lo que nos da más fuerza para seguir. Eso es lo que nos hace que estemos aquí sentados, que trabajemos todos los días, y más que nada lo que he dicho, o sea, el principal eh, problema, problema, en este caso es eh, la falta de, de profesionales que sepan enseñar lenguas. Es muy diferente hablarlas a saber enseñarlas. Entonces ahí tenemos uno de los problemas. La otra, la, la, el otro tema es producir los suficientes materiales educativos para, para que estos sean eh, incluidos en el sistema educativo. Y la otra cuestión es un, un tema más epistémico, más epistemológico, en cómo llegar con un sistema propio a los pueblos indígenas. Para eso nosotros tenemos el modelo del sistema de educación intercultural bilingüe, pero para que este puede ser desarrollado necesita, necesita eh, profundizar en estudios lingüísticos, en conocimiento de los saberes ancestrales, en cómo tenemos metodologías propias de enseñanza y en cómo es nuestra propia pedagogía. Entonces, ahí hay un reto, y ahí sí necesitamos el reto eh, compartirlo con la academia. Como decía, nosotros sabemos nuestros problemas, sabemos nuestros desafíos, pero esto nos, no nos detiene en seguir trabajando por la educación. Muchas gracias. Thank you uh, for listening to us and for your um, very uh, interactive and um, uh, retroactive ret for your retroaction on our um, speak speech species. I'm sorry for my English. Um, I would like to uh, also agree with my um, sister, the Quechua speaker. Unfortunately, I don't know her name. Uh, about the end of the uh, intercultural education as well as uh, bil bilingu or bilingual, which is, uh, on, on my sense, an, a, another synonym. And it's uh, a, 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 an euphemism. We say in English euphemism. Yes, an euphemism for uh, acculturation, in my sense. Um, but we are today in a world that where also we have to be uh, in part of. So I, I think that um, we, we have to, to be more, um, uh, more um, tolerant about uh, the other languages, uh, because if we have not access to uh, the colonizer languages, we, for us it's colonizer languages, uh, we can't access to, uh, to, to, to word. For example, if I couldn't speak some word of English, I could not be today in this panel and being able to uh, share my thoughts and also advocate for uh, our languages. So there are some uh, compromises that uh, we are obliged to do. But st still there is that question, why is why us, it's for us to do the compromises and why not the others to come to our languages? Unfortunately, we are not in that stage yet, but we saw through uh, some researchers, uh, for example, the uh, anthropologists who uh, 
come to us and they learn our languages. And at, uh, on this side, there are those one who are colonized. So uh, everything is possible and um, we have to be um, more um, realistic, but also continue to uh, work to, for, for our languages. Uh, the other thing that has been raised also is um, the problem of uh, assimilation, uh, but in another way. For example, in, uh, acceptance by the others. Uh, the others has to accept our languages. But also my colleague um, in the same line um, uh, thought about the, the, the role of the uh, language teachers or academics uh, in, in the context of languages to, um, to make more attractive our languages, uh, um, in particular for the new generation, because they, uh, they, they, they go to areas, as it has been mentioned earlier by my brother from Ecuador, when, our, uh, when the um, indigenous people go to cities, the youth mostly, they, ha they are stigmatized by their language, if they speak their language, or even by other cultural expression like dressing. So uh, they are more tempted uh, to, because they are vulnerable, uh, they are more tempted to, uh, to, to let their language not speak it, uh, and also not dress their traditional dresses. Uh, that uh, that is also a big challenge. So we have to promote, and this goes through media, through through uh, promotion, but through educators also who has to uh, really uh, teach to uh, youth uh, the uh, self um, self proud of what you are and of your language. To uh, uh, that uh, it will stay to. It will live and you will be proud on what you are. Finally, I would like again to reiterate my thanks to, to uh, the organizers and for all of you who are, have a big interest on the issue. And I look forward to the outcome of uh, this symposium. Thank you. Uh, I wanted, I, I, I rethought several times what I was going to say now. So, um, I think that uh, I have to just pronounce two things. One uh, is uh, one of my friend, um, Annika Pasanen, uh, who was uh, dealt with the revitalization of uh, Inner Sami language in Finland. Uh, she introduced me uh, to one uh, very good uh, expression that uh, we uh, do not have um, opportunity to be pessimists. Yeah, uh, we have to be optimists. And uh, if we are dealing with the revitalization of languages of indigenous people. And I think uh, this uh, phrase is applicable to any kind of uh, area if we, are take, uh, if we are talking about indigenous people, interests, rights, and their indigenous area. Another thing is uh, about the respect uh, of indigenous languages. I, uh, I, in the dialogue with um, my neighbor, she is a local uh, from my village, she say uh, that why, it's, it's like a, about the tolerance. I don't like uh, the term in uh, tolerance uh, because I'm a little bit uh, uh, fed up of uh, the to programs for tolerance. We are we have been too tolerant to aggressive uh, environment. I mean, the indigenous people. So this this uh, this lady told uh, to one journalist in the dialogue: uh, When you are coming to somebody's house, you are 
asking what kind of rules you have in this house. Uh, I'm not talking about permission to come in, but at the, uh, if you are coming, if, you, if you're already in the house, you're asking, can I do this or this, or what kind of language, what kind of language, uh, what kind of type of communication you have here. So, and she said it, why at our lands, at our indigenous territories, we have to ask some kind of strangers or guests about the rules, their rules. We would like the guests to follow our rules. Uh, and th this uh, also, uh, in terms of language, and to 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 to, to finalize, uh, I want to say. Um, in my uh, native language, we have a uh, like kind of saying, Ken nosta harakan ajalla niinku omat siivet. Who can uh, uh, lift the bird uh, to the fence uh, other than its own uh, shivet, sivet? Uh, wings, yes. Uh, so I think this is uh, kind of our way because uh, we, even we are trying to use the law and to push the governments, I think first of all we need to preserve uh, the, 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 this, uh, yeah, in our, we, we, we should start from the family. Thank you. Just maybe very quickly to reply to the question of uh, socio-cultural representation. Uh, so, um, for the preparation of the action plan, we had a number of consultations, as already said, and we invited, uh, according to the uh, UN Permanence Forum, uh, regional uh, distribution, social, cultural groups to, to nominate their representation. So, it's not done by uh, language groups, but by um, social, cultural uh, regions. Uh, which are within the permanent forum. So we cannot invent here new structures, but the way how it functions the forum. And uh, uh, we have seven regions in the forum. UNESCO has uh, six electoral groups, and this is why we have six, we expect to have six members from the countries. Uh, so that just to reply to the, to the question. And to complete, uh, once again, uh, you are most welcome to join the initiative. Uh, international, it's an international cooperation mechanism. So it means all stakeholders are invited to join and contribute to implementation. It's not only for UN, it's not only for UNESCO to do the work. We all have to work together at different levels. And you are most welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you as well to, to uh, all of you. Uh, uh, four, four very quick points. Uh, first of all, I'm really, uh, um, I think, at the same level as uh, Otilia, who, who challenged uh, consideration of perhaps looking at the international year for the time to demand reparations, as she said through the interpreter, for genocide. I think those of you who were at the permanent forum heard me ask the special advisor on genocide to look at this question because it seems like we're afraid to talk about it. It has come up several times now, uh, both at the permanent forum and at the expert mechanism. So. Having said that, also she suggested to UNESCO, and I support this because it's an existing mechanism, to convene, to convene the ministers of education and culture, uh, just to um, perhaps even take a pulse check on where are we, where are we at through their ministries on this issue of um, languages. The <clears throat> Third point I wanted to, to make was um, I didn't have time to, to promote a bias, but there is a role, an important role for uh, sport and traditional games to promote language. 
Because games that children play is an opportune time to promote language because we have to explain the rules of the game in our language. Otherwise, it's not a traditional game. Um, the last point I want to uh, raise is a question to you. There is a group very actively promoting a universal language. In other words, one language for everybody around the world. And they have taken interventions at the UN. And I'm not sure whether that's a counter to our attempt to promote indigenous languages. It isn't? Do you? Maybe you could explain that. Is Esperanto, I think it's called? Yeah. But it's an interesting um, uh, discussion that they proposed to the UN. Uh, at least I've heard several uh, presentations on that now. Uh, are these counteractive or are they complementary? So thank you. Please uh, help me to uh, thank our panelists. <coughs> thank you.